Hello and welcome to the section of the circuit analysis tutor. In this section we're going to talk about the circuit element called the inductor. So we'll talk about what an inductor is, why it's important, how does it compare to what we've learned in the past, and then in the next several sections we will have some basic circuits that we'll uh, begin to analyze that will have inductors in them and you'll get some experience with trying to understand and predict what's going to happen when you have inductors in circuits. After that we're going to talk about a capacitor. Uh, the circuit element that we called capacitors and we'll do the same kind of thing. We'll talk about why it's important, why it's useful, some basic circuits with capacitors, and then as we march down the course, meaning this set of lessons and, and the lessons that follow in, in volumes to come, uh, capacitors and inductors will be in almost every single circuit. There is not a single circuit that you could open up in your house, you know, television, phone, uh, video camera, anything. There's not a single circuit that you could open up in your house and look in there and not find a capacitor. There's very few that you could open up and not find an inductor. They're absolutely central, critical circuit elements to shape and, and, and cause the circuit to do what we want it to do. All right, so before we get there, let's kind of back the truck up a little bit, do a little bit of a, a synopsis verbally of what we've covered to this point in the circuit classes that we've done so far. Because ultimately, it's taught this way for a reason, okay? So what we did is we first started talking about what is voltage, what is current, what is resistance. Those are fundamental things that affect all circuit elements. They're also going to apply to capacitors and inductors. So the concept of what current is, the concept of what voltage is, things like that, they're going to apply to what we're doing here. Right? And then we started doing basic resistive uh, circuits using Ohm's law to calculate the current through the circuit. All right, so we did that kind of thing. And then we did Kirchhoff's laws, you know, Kirchhoff's current laws and Kirchhoff's voltage laws, where we looked at different circuit uh, meshes and circuit configurations and figuring out that at a node, the current coming in, the current leaving a node has got to algebraically balance, going and walking around loops in circuits, the Kirchhoff voltage laws, you have to sum those voltages up to zero. All of those concepts apply to circuits with inductors and capacitors. So that's why we learn this bedrock first, because if you kind of make it too complicated with inductors and capacitors first, then it kind of gets, it gets mushy. So we do a lot of analysis with resistors first, so that you can get the concept of the, of the analysis down. And then we introduce slightly more complicated elements like this. All right, finishing up the discussion, we did uh, Thevenin and Norton equivalent circuits, which is a nice way to simplify circuits. And we did a lot of so solving the circuit, solving the current, solving the voltage everywhere by using simultaneous equations. We've used mesh currents and we've used node voltages. So if you, if you think back, we've learned several techniques for analyzing circuits up to this point. Right? And what I'm trying to tell you is once we get through the basic idea of uh, inductors and capacitors, what we're going to end up doing is going to more complicated type of circuits that have resistors, inductors, and capacitors, and we'll have to analyze those circuits. And, and kind of the punchline is all of these techniques that we've learned before, the Thevenin equivalents, the Norton equivalents, the node voltages, the mesh currents, all of those relations that we, or at least the basic flavor of those techniques, they're basically going to be applicable to circuits that have different elements like inductors and capacitors. So that's why we do it that way. That's why we spend so much time with resistors. All right. So before we can walk, we need to crawl. I need to explain what an inductor is uh, uh, to you. So what we're going to do is write that. So here we have something called inductor, right? The symbol for an inductor uh, in a circuit is very simple. So it goes like this, and you kind of see like a coil of wire, like a little spring like that. So here's the two terminals. You know, like a resistor goes up, down, up, down, up, down. Well, an inductor is like a little coil of wire in there. All right. Let me write in a different color the units of inductance or the units of inductors, uh, as you might see written in a circuit diagram, is called the Henry and the symbol is H. That's why I put it in brackets like that. All right, so if you think back to uh, resistors, uh, the symbol for resistor was that up and down line. The units of resistance was the ohm, which is omega, right? So here, the symbol of inductance is a coil of wire. You got two sides of it, and you've got a coil here, and the units is uh, a Henry. Now, just to kind of show you kind of what you might actually see, 
If you open up you know, a computer or a power supply and look on the board, you're probably going to see a few places where it looks like there's actually coils of wire on the board. Those are inductors, right? And the purpose of an inductor we'll get to a little bit later, but that, that's what they're basically doing. Now, if you look at different inductors, see the way I've drawn it here, it looks just like there's a coil of wire with like air inside. That's, pro that's, that's very uh, much like inductors are actually constructed. They literally are coils of wire that are wound very closely together, but not touching because, you know, you, you want to have an insulation between each uh, coil of the wire. You don't want the, the wires touching, so they have to be insulated wires. But they're very tightly coiled wires. Now, some inductors do have air inside, so you could look through it and actually just see right down the barrel um, there. But some inductors have metal, like maybe iron, inside of the coil. So you'll see the coil, and then you'll see like a piece of iron inside, right? The reason that they build them that way is because of what we're about to talk about now. An inductor basically is a circuit element that stores energy in a magnetic field, right? So that bears repeating. So it's, it's so incredibly important that you just have to, you have to internalize this and understand it so that whenever you look at circuits, you know what's going on. A inductor, the purpose of it is basically to store energy in a magnetic field. And you might say, well, that sounds complicated. How could that possibly happen? Well, what's going on here is you have a wire and you have it coiled. So if I send current, electric current, down this wire, what's going to happen is the current's going to go and then it's going to start going through the coil, right? Because it's one continuous piece of, of wire that's coiled up on it like, like a spring. So the, the current is going to go round and round and round and round and round. Maybe, maybe this coil, I have four coils there, but in a real inductor there might be a 100 turns or 75 turns, right? The more turns basically is going to concentrate the magnetic field inside of this hollow region inside of there. Right? Now, the reason why it concentrates magnetic field, I could teach you, but it's, it's, not really, um, it's not really the point of this class to teach you the physics there. But if you look at the magnetic field on a wire, and you look at the geometry of a coil, then when you run electric current down there and you do the physics, then inside of that coil, the magnetic field is going to be concentrated inside of this coil. Right? So it's going to kind of go, it's like a donut, but it's strongest inside of this coil. The more turns you have, the stronger that magnetic field is going to be, right? And also, if you have a metal core, like an iron core inside of there, it also tends to concentrate that magnetic field also. So that's why a lot of uh, real inductors that you see are not going to have air inside. They'll actually have a piece of metal in there, and that, the purpose of that is to try to concentrate that magnetic field there, all right? So the units uh, are Henry. Don't worry too much about that right now. Uh, there's you know, lots of physics we could go in and, and show you what a Henry is really equal to. But the point is, on a circuit diagram, you might see 50 ohm resistor, 75 kilo ohm resistor. You might see a 50 milli Henry inductor, or a 100 milli Henry inductor, or a half of a Henry inductor, or something like that. So all the metric prefixes apply, but the base unit uh, is Henry. All right. Now, just to kind of totally reiterate, so we have this inductor, we send current in it. We know from physics that when we run current uh, in a wire, a, a magnetic field is generated. By coiling it like that, we're concentrating that magnetic field inside of that coil right there. All right. So the other thing is, if you believe me, and I know that you all do, that by putting a current in a wire like that, especially a coil of wire, we get a concentrated magnetic field inside that coil then it stands to reason that if I change that current, if I make the current go up and down, let's say I have like a knob on my current source, and I go up and then down, and I literally turn it with my hands, so I can vary with time the current going through here, maybe I can make the current go bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller, then you kind of have to use your x-ray goggles to kind of visualize it, but if you can visualize this magnetic field here, if I crank the current higher, that magnetic field gets stronger, so you can kind of see it getting stronger in there. If I back that current off closer to zero, that magnetic field gets weaker uh, in there. So by changing the current, we can change the strength of the magnetic field. Now I'm going to pause here for just a second before I write anything else, because I've got something else very important to tell you about inductors. I'm going to pause here and tell you that later on when we get to capacitors, I'm getting way ahead of myself and I'm giving you a preview. Uh, capacitors, they don't store energy as a magnetic field. Capacitors store energy 
uh, and an electric field inside the capacitor plates. We'll, we'll talk about that later, but inside the capacitor. So I'm kind of getting, giving you a little bit of a preview ahead of time. You know, you have the, the, the good old resistor we've learned so far. It doesn't really store energy at all. It just dissipates energy. It heats up whenever you put current in there. But I'm trying to tell you that inductors, they store energy in the form of a magnetic field, right? That you can then remove later if you'd like to, almost like a battery kind of, right? And then you have capacitors, which store energy in a circuit in an electric field. So they're kind of opposites of one another. Here you store energy as a magnetic field. Here you store energy as an electric field. And we'll get into all the calculations of how you figure all that stuff out later. But I'm just trying to let you know the big picture is that you have inductors and capacitors. They're kind of like peanut butter and jelly, right? They're, they're, they're cousins, right? They operate in a circuit in, with slightly different fields, but their purpose is to store energy, right? So you can build complicated circuits that use these phenomena to do what you want, like transmit radio waves or operate a microwave oven or whatever, because you're obviously you're trying to deal with handling energy in those circuits. All right, so we've talked about the symbol for an inductor. We've described what an inductor would look like. We've talked about the fact that it stores energy in a magnetic field. Now it's time to look at what an inductor might look like from the point of view of circuit um, analysis. All right, so let me go and draw a little line here. I'm going to write down an incredibly important equation on the board, and I want you, you know, to not be too scared of it, but we're going to learn from it. So let me go and write this inductor down again. And I'm just going to write the same inductor down. So here is an inductor, coil of wire, right? Now this inductor, we're going to call it inductance L, which could be 10 millihenries, 20 millihenries, whatever. All right? So much like, uh, much like um, resistors, right? We might send a current down this inductor. Now when I draw it like this, what I mean is it's going through the coil over, you know, round and round and round, then it comes out the other side. That's what that means. But let's say we send a current I down this inductor. Now, much like resistors, you might expect there to be a voltage across that inductor, right? Remember Ohm's law? We talked about Ohm's law before. If you have a resistor, you're sending a current down there, there has to be a voltage across it, and we use the passive sign convention. The direction of the current flow, we have a voltage drop, plus to minus, right? If you just make a resistor here, this drawing is something we've covered many, many, many times before. When you have the passive sign convention, you have current going, you should have a voltage drop across your circuit element. So that's the sign convention for an inductor. When you have a current going through it, you should have a voltage drop across it. But the major catch, the major difference, the thing that makes you scratch your head is if it were a resistor, I'll just write this here, if it were a resistor, if it were, if it were a resistor, I'll put if here, then what you would have is V is equal to IR where R is the resistance. Of course, we don't have any R here. We have inductance, L, which actually I forgot to tell you. The, the unit of inductance is a Henry, but we, we refer to, uh, instead of R uh, for resistance, we refer to it as L, right? So for L, it means inductor. And by the way, you use L because, you know, it's an inductor, so you think you might use it call I, you know, uh, I inductance or whatever. But I is current, so you really can't use I. So we use a different, uh, a different letter. C is going to be for capacitor. R is going to be for resistor. L is going to be for inductance. I know it's a little weird, but we just have to do that because we can't use I again. But anyway, if this were a resistor, you would have V is equal to I R like this. But this is not a resistor. So we're going to kind of X through this. Right? And what you really want to know, or what you really want to memorize, is that the voltage across this inductor is equal to its inductance L times the derivative of the current with respect to time. Right? And I'm going to circle this because really this equation here is really the point of this entire section to explain to you that the voltage across the inductor is L di dt. So repeat this with me a few times. I had to do it when I learned circuits. It really does help. Uh, v is L di dt. Voltage is L di dt. V is L di dt. So say that over and over again. So when you're talking about inductors, it's not current times resistance. There's no resistance here. We haven't discussed the concept of resistance in terms of inductors. But we have talked about the concept of inductance. The more coils of wire, the higher the inductance value, the more it stores magnetic field. Right? This voltage here is equal to, uh, or proportional to, or equal to, the value of the inductance times the IDT. Now, for those of you who have calculus under your belt, 
you know that this means the derivative of the current i with respect to time. For those of you who haven't had much calculus or don't remember any calculus, that's okay. I'm going to explain to you what this means. Basically, what this means is how fast the current i changes through the inductor L, right? So what this means is that, <clears throat> all right, what this means is that if I have a inductor with a value of, of so many Henry's or so many milli Henry's, okay, and I put a current through it, let's say, right? And that current is steadily increasing. In other words, I have a knob on my meter and I increase it, increase it, increase it, increase it, increase it. I'm increasing the current. Right? That means that di dt, the derivative or the change of current with respect to time, is a constant because it's constantly increasing. Then I'll have a number for the rate of change of that current times the inductance. That is the voltage across that inductor. So if I actually go in the lab, put an inductor on in a circuit, hook a current source up to it, and then slowly increase the current where I'm changing the current constantly at a certain rate. That's di dt, right? and then I multiply that rate times the inductance, then I'm going to have a voltage across that inductor that I can measure with a voltmeter. I can put the probes across and see that it's so many millivolts or whatever. Right? But it's proportional to the rate of change. It's not proportional to the current. It's not that the voltage is proportional to the current. You have to get that out of your head. It's not proportional to how many amps is flowing through it. I could have 100 million amps flowing through this inductor, but no voltage. Right? Because it's not proportional to the current. It's proportional to how fast the current changes. Right? How fast the current changes. To put this in perspective again, let's say I put 10 amps through this inductor. 10 amps. That's a lot of current. That current could kill you. Right? But let's say I don't change the current. It's a constant 10 amps. So I have a, br a breadboard here, a circuit, and I have an inductor. I hook a current source and I send 10 amps through it. But I don't change it. It's a constant 10 amps. The 10 amps is constantly flowing around and around and around and around and around. Well, even though it's 10 amps, the rate of change of that current, how fast the current is changing, is zero. If I put a constant current, whether it's a constant 1 amp, or a constant 5 amps, or a constant 10 amps, or a constant 100 amps, or whatever, if it's not changing, then di dt is zero. So that means zero times anything is zero. So anytime I have a current flowing through an inductor, right, that's not changing. That's not going up and down or changing or increasing or decreasing or whatever if it's just constant. Like if I hook a 9-volt battery up to an inductor, right, there's going to be current flowing, but it's not going to be changing with time. Then that means the voltage across an inductor is zero. Anytime I have current flowing through it, that's not changing. I keep kind of saying the thing over and over again because, you know, when you do circuits later, you're going to have to think about that. You're going to have to think about, okay, is there current changing here? Is there current not changing through here? You're going to have to start thinking in terms of that. So let me ask you a question, all right? Um, if what I'm telling you is true, that if I'm not changing the current, that the voltage cross it is zero, how could that be? How could that really be? How could I have 50 amps going through something, but no voltage going across it? Doesn't Ohm's law apply? Well, sure, Ohm's law always applies, but it's V is equal to IR. We haven't said there's any resistance with this thing. In fact, if you notice, it's a coil of wire, right? There's no resistor inside here. It's literally just a coil of wire. It's a coil of wire. What is the resistance of a perfect wire? Resistance of a perfect wire is zero. Think about that. The resistance of a perfect wire is zero. So if I build a circuit where the only thing in it is an inductor and a battery, and I let it run for a long time, then that inductor is just going to look like a piece of wire to that battery, even though it's coiled up like that. And that's what this is reflecting, right? So when you have a constant current going through it, where everything's reached steady state, and everything's kind of settled out, and I have a constant current flowing through this coil, we call an inductor, then the, the, the fact of the matter is that inductor is going to look like just a piece of wire. It's going to look like a short circuit. It's going to look like something that has zero volts across it, just like any wire. This piece of wire right here has got zero volts across it because all perfect wires we say are perfect. They don't have any resistance, right? So I want to kind of summarize everything because we're closing this section out, more or less. I just want to kind of get across the voltage equation here. In the next section, we'll have a, a real circuit uh, to show you how this works and to kind of solidify it, but I'm kind of doing a lot of talking here because uh, this kind of concept can, can confuse you. Um, so let me kind of summarize from the beginning and then we'll close the section out. All right, so let me go ahead and write this 
Uh, let me go ahead and write it right underneath it. Let me use green, okay? So let me put a couple notes down just to kind of make sure everybody's on the same page. If I have a constant current, then what does that mean? That means zero volts across L. Constant current, no changes of current means I have zero volts across the thing. All right, let me switch colors here. If I see that I have current through the inductor and the current rises, means it increases positively, that means the derivative di dt is going to be positive. If the current's rising, it's going to be positive. So that means I'm going to have a positive voltage. Positive voltage across this inductor. So if I have this inductor, I'm sending a current down and I'm increasing the uh, I'm increasing the current, then the voltage here is going to be a positive value in terms of how I've drawn it here. And then the final thing I want to say, if the current falls or decreases, then that means I'm going to have a negative voltage. Right, make sure you understand that. The same equation holds, L, D, I, D, T, but in terms of how I've drawn it here, if I have a current going this way, let's say I have 10 amps and then I'm decreasing it, that means D, I, D, T is getting smaller because I'm decreasing it, right? In terms of calculus, when you have something, you know, a, a function that's decreasing and you take its derivative, you get a negative derivative, right? So if I have something doing this and I'm decreasing the current, that means D, I, D, T is negative. So that means my voltage will be negative. So that kind of brings me to another point I want to make sure you understand. In this drawing, we've drawn current going this way and we've drawn a voltage drop like this, but you got to keep in mind that this is kind of a, a perfect picture. It's assuming that this current is increasing. It's assuming a positive increase of the current. So the voltage could actually be flipped around. When we say it has a negative voltage, what we mean is the positive is really over here and the negative is really over here. If I, if I put a current through it and decreased it where di dt was small or going, getting smaller, then the voltage would be flipped from what I have right here. So I want to summarize in a few minutes here everything we've talked about. And then when we get to the next section, we'll draw a real circuit uh, where we can really look at it and I can show you mathematically how this is really working. We have this circuit element called an inductor. It's a coil of wire. The purpose of its uh, journey in life is to store a magnetic field. And there's lots of uses for that we'll get to later. And you just have to trust me that there's lots of reasons you might want to temporarily store a magnetic field in a circuit. All right? But a, as a consequence of that, Whenever it's because it's a coil of wire, if I just send a constant current through it where, where nothing is changing, then it just looks like a piece of wire. So di dt is zero, and the voltage across that thing is going to be zero anytime I have a constant current flowing through an inductor of any, of any direction and of any size. If it's constant, it's voltage across, it's going to be zero. All right? But if I start increasing this current, where I'm increasing it with time, what's really happening is if I increase this current and make it stronger, 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 then that means the magnetic field in here is getting stronger, 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 stronger. If you remember back from physics, when you have a magnetic field that's getting stronger, 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 the field lines are moving. They're getting kind of bigger, for lack of a better word, and they're cutting across this inductor. So the reason that a voltage is generated whenever di dt is positive is because when you ram more current into this thing, the magnetic field tries to get stronger, and when it does that, it's cutting across across these these coils. And from uh, physics, you know that whenever you have a coil of wire sitting in a changing magnetic field, you're going to get a voltage that's going to try to oppose that, right? So the voltage is going to try to oppose that. So a voltage pops up to do that. So if it's a positive increase in current, you're going to get this voltage. If the current is decreasing, di dt is going to be negative, and so you're going to have a voltage. Basically, it's going to be opposite of the way we drew it here. All right. But the point is, when you think about inductors, and later on when we talk about capacitors, because it's going to be very similar, uh, the voltage is not proportional to the current. The voltage is proportional to how the current changes. It all comes back to basic physics from a long time ago that you've learned that whenever you have, and by the way, you know, you can go and look at some of my physics lessons and learn even more detail why this happens. Basically, when you increase the current, you're trying to make that magnetic field get bigger, 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 stronger, stronger, stronger. And it's sitting, a coil of wire is sitting in there. When you have those field lines cutting across that coil, you're going to get a voltage that's generated to try to stop it from, from getting bigger. 
uh, you know, from growing out to infinity, so you're going to have that voltage there that's going to pop up. The voltage that's generated, we've drawn here, right? But in terms of circuits, you don't really have to think about too much in terms of magnetic field. All you need to think about is, is current increasing or decreasing? If it is, I've got a voltage in this sense. If the current's decreasing, I've got a voltage in the opposite sense. If the current is, uh, is, is not changing at all, it's a fixed value, then I have no voltage drop at all across this inductor. All right, so make sure you understand this section. Watch it a few times. I can't say how important it is for you to have a good grasp of, of this concept. Follow me on to the next section. We're going to draw a real circuit on the board and show you how you can use the voltage drop across an inductor to learn a lot about how inductors actually operate.